Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Vijaya Dudiala. Dr. Dudiala is a primary care provider and is board certified in internal medicine. She earned her medical degree at Osmania Medical College in India and completed her internship and residency at St. Barnabas Hospital in Bronx, New York. Dr. Dudiala served as a hospitalist at Washington Hospital and other hospitals in the region before deciding to open her own private practice in 2014. Good afternoon. Today I'm going to talk about high blood pressure and high cholesterol, how you can make a difference in your lives with the lifestyle modifications and what are the strategies that you can apply to your life to get them under control along with your doctors. So first topic today I'm going to talk about is hypertension. Before we talk high blood pressure, we should know what normal blood pressure is. So it is a pressure exerted by the blood. When it is going through the blood vessels, it puts some pressure on the blood vessel wall that is the pressure is called the blood pressure. So when you go to doctor's office, they will put numbers 120, 80. What is 120, what is 80? So you should know. The top number that 120, usually that's a normal blood pressure, 120, 80. So the top number is called systolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is the blood pressure when the heart is pumping the blood, how much is the pressure in the blood vessels? That is the systolic blood pressure. And the lower number indicates the diastolic blood pressure. So what is the diastolic blood pressure? When the heart is relaxing and trying to feel the blood, how amount of the pressure in the blood vessels is called the diastolic blood pressure. So the top one, when the heart pumps the blood, the maximum pressure that exerts on the blood vessel wall is the systolic blood pressure. The diastolic is when the heart is relaxed, that is the number diastolic blood pressure. So hypertension, the normal blood pressure is 120, 80. Higher than that is called the hi hypertension. So when the blood pressure is high, the heart has to work hard to pump the blood into the vessels. So what are the normal numbers and what are the abnormal numbers? When we talk about <coughs> hypertension, what we should know the normal numbers and abnormal numbers and when to treat them. So normal blood pressure is when the systolic is less than 120, diastolic is less than 80, that is the normal blood pressure. When the pressure is 120 to 139, systolic and 80 to 89 is the diastolic blood pressure that's called prehypertension. When the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is between 140 to 159 and diastolic 90 to 99 is called stage 1 hypertension. Next is the stage 2 hypertension. That is when the blood pressure is above 160 systolic and diastolic blood pressure above 100, it's called the stage 2 hypertension. So there are a couple of things which are not related to the numbers that you should know. One is hypertensive emergency. How much is the blood pressure when it is high that it is emergency that you have to seek the medical attention? That is the hypertensive emergency that I am going to talk about. It is when the blood pressure is elevated and it is causing the, some acute damage to the target organs. So what are the target organs? When the blood pressure goes up, it might affect your heart, brain, causing the heart attack, stroke, or some vision problems and affecting high, uh, eye and kidney. It is a life-threatening condition. When the blood pressure is high and you have the headache, chest pain, or blurring of vision, you should seek the medical attention. Usually the blood pressure above 180 or 110 with these symptoms, you have to seek the medical attention immediately. Since it's a life-threatening uh, situation, the doctors might admit you to the hospital. They might have to give you the IV medications to bring the blood pressure down while they are carefully monitoring you in ICU. So this is very important to know when to seek the medical attention immediately. The other thing is hypertensive urgency. So when you check your blood pressure at home, if it is above 180 systolic and 110 diastolic blood pressure, 
and without any target organ damage. That is called hypertensive urgency. So, essentially when the blood pressure is high above 180, 110, you should contact your doctor immediately and they will decide whether you have any problems that you need to go to the hospital to get treated immediately or they have to increase your medications. So, in this hypertensive urgency, they have to give you some oral medications to bring down the blood pressure and they might keep you under observation for a few hours and once the blood pressure comes down, they can let you go home. But for hyper hypertensive emergency, you might need to be admitted to ICU and get treated for that. So what are the types of hypertension? There are two types of hypertension. One is primary hypertension, the other one is the secondary hypertension. Primary hypertension is when there is no underlying cause and the blood pressure is high. But for secondary hypertension, you might be having some kidney problem, some hormonal issues, some other diseases which are increasing the hypertension. When you have the secondary hypertension, you have to address the underlying disease first to bring down the blood pressure. For primary hypertension, you have to treat the blood pressure. So, and there is one more thing that I haven't included here is the white coat hypertension. So, when the patients come to their doctor's office, their blood pressure is high. Consistently, it is high in the doctor's office, but at home, it is normal. It's called white coat hypertension. So, sometimes it's a good idea to check your blood pressure when you're relaxed and when you're at home to see what is the difference and whether you need to be treated. So, what are the symptoms and signs of hypertension? When you have the high blood pressure, what is that it's going to happen? How are you going to know about it? Most of the times, it does, you do not, do not see any difference. You will be normal, your blood pressure is elevated. Or sometimes you will have very non-specific symptoms like some headache, some blurring of vision, dizziness, some nausea, and sometimes the face is flushed and you have some shortness of breath, uneasiness. So these are the symptoms. Then you might have the question, why should we treat it when I'm not feeling anything? So there is the reason that why you should treat it because silent, it's called a silent killer. Silently, it will be damaging your heart, your kidneys, and causing changes in the blood vessels. It is a high risk for the stroke, for heart attack, and kidney damage. So what are the risk factors? Number one, age. As you age, your blood pressure goes up. Over 60 years of age, approximately 65% of the people will have high blood pressure. Race. African Americans are at high risk to develop hypertension than the others. Obesity. When you have Overweight or obesity, it is also another risk factor for hypertension. Sex, males will have the hypertension somewhere around 40 to 50. It levels off at the age of 50. For females, their blood pressure starts going up after their men menopause. Somewhere around 50 to 55, more, pe more females will have hypertension. Overall rate is 29%. Sex, males will have 29.7 and females 28.5. So. The age, at the age of 18 to 39, the blood pressure is 7.3 percent, people will have the hypertension. At the age 40 to 59, 32 percent, approximately 32 percent people have the high blood pressure. But look at this, at age 60 and over, 65 percent of the people will have high blood pressure. As you age, your blood pressure will go up and causing the hypertension. So regarding the race, African American, non-Hispanic African American, 42 percent have the hypertension and Caucasians 28, Asians 24 percent. So we talked about age, race, obesity, <coughs> sex and lifestyle. So people who have under a lot of stress and who is eating excessive salt and who are obese, consuming alcohol, smoking, which are the things which I'm going to talk in detail are going to be the risk factors. These are the lifestyle that makes a difference where you can interfere and change your, the strategies for your blood pressure. So again, why should we treat the hypertension? Earlier, as I told you that when you have high blood pressure, you may not feel anything. You will feel normal, your numbers will be high. But we have to treat because it increases the risk of heart attack, heart failure, stroke, renal failure, and vision problems. It causes these problems. Not only that, economic burden on this country is like it cost, cost $46 billion per year. The cost is for healthcare services, the medications that we take, and number of lost work days. So what are the external factors that affect? Again, the same thing, the risk factors are the external factors mostly we'll be talking about. These are excessive intake of sodium. If you're eating more than 300 milligrams of sodium, your blood pressure will be increased. Stress temporarily increases obesity, alcohol, and smoking. 
among the factors that we talked, race, we cannot change it. Genetics, we cannot change. If you have the family history of high blood pressure, you are at high risk, but you cannot change that. Sex, you cannot change, and age, it's not under our control. So the strategies to control hypertension are the sum of the few risk factors which we can change, that's what is going to be now. Sodium, again, as I discussed earlier, sodium of 300 milligrams and high intake will increase your blood pressure. The recommended sodium is 1500 milligrams per day. So how does it increase the blood pressure? So when you take excessive sodium, it, ke it draws the uh, water into your blood. Along with the sodium, it has to have some water. So the volume increases. Then the heart has to pump harder to circulate that volume. So your blood pressure goes up. The recommended sodium intake should be 1500 milligrams per day. And the salt content, it's more than the food that you cook. It can, can be already present in the food that you buy. So check the label carefully to see how much, is the, uh, how much salt is there in the food that you buy to eat. So those are the most common culprits are the canned foods, the canned pickles, packaged foods like chips, tortillas that you don't have the control over. That can increase. And sometimes soy sauce, I think, has uh, increased salt too. Fresh frozen meats are better than processed meats. But it's always a good idea to check on the label what is the sodium content in the food. Sometimes stress will elevate your blood pressure, but on a consistent basis, it is not a, as such it's a direct uh, culprit for the hypertension. But when you are under stress, you don't bother to check the food habits. Sometimes you might end up consuming more alcohol. Sometimes you will smoke. So those are I that is indir indirectly contributing to the hypertension. But I have uh, some experiences that where one patient was consistently under a lot of pressure and I started her on one medication, not enough, started second medication, not enough. Then she downloaded an app, relaxation techniques. It's like an op app called uh, Simple Habit on her iPhone. It guides you for five minutes to relax, breathing techniques to relax. After she started that, there is a significant improvement in her blood pressure. So stress will definitely play a significant role. Obesity increases your risk of hypertension. And there are some studies which shows that if you lose some weight without even exercise or without even reducing the salts in diet, just losing some pounds will help to reduce your blood pressure. So it's an independent risk factor. Alcohol. It is acceptable to drink one drink a day for women and two drinks per ma man per day. So if a woman is drinking more than two or more drinks, males, three or more drinks, they are going to be at high risk for hypertension. So there are studies that have shown that the co consumption of alcohol, if it is increased, it directly increases your blood pressure. So some studies did show that when you cut down your alcohol level, the blood pressure did go down. So consuming alcohol more than one drink per day for females and more than two drinks per male is going to be a risk factor for hypertension. So what is that? one drink per day. So there are different types of alcohols. So like, you know, if you are drinking a beer, one drink is 12 ounces of beer. And one drink for wine is four ounces. And 1.5 ounces of 80 proof spirit is one drink. And one ounce of 100 proof spirit is considered as one drink. So some of the medications that you commonly take might also increase your blood pressure. So those are the medications, very common medications are like you know, when you have pains and aches, you will take Motrin, Advil, or all the NSAID medications, those can increase your blood pressures. And medications like you, know, you take for the colds contain the decongestants, that can elevate your blood pressure. And also if you have to be on certain medications containing the steroids, that will increase your blood pressures. Some diet pills and birth control pills and anxiety medication, depression medication can also increase your blood pressures. So it's always a good idea if you are taking any over-the-counter medications or any supplements to talk to your doctor is important so that they will see if there is, these are the medications that's causing any problems and they have to interfere with those things. Treatments. So the treatment options are first and foremost thing is the lifestyle modification. Second thing is the medical management. So when your blood pressure is high, so based on the numbers, your doctor will talk to you about your lifestyle modifications. So DASH diet. What is DASH diet? It's a diet which helps you to control your blood pressure, which contains for you to eat high content of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, poultry, fish. 
and they recommend to cut down on your sweets and uh, added sweet drinks, beverages, and also asks you to cut down on the red meat. So again, earlier, as I mentioned, you have to avoid the processed meats, processed fish or whatever, the canned, processed, stored foods, than fresh, free, uh, fresh meats and fresh vegetables. So exercise. Exercise, <coughs> there is a study which shows that if you are exercising for 30 to 40 minutes with aerobic exercises or resistant training exercises, that will reduce your blood pressure. So you have to exercise at least, the study shows that if you exercise for 40 minutes, three to four times a week, and for 12 weeks, if you exercise, that is going to improve your blood pressure. So exercise is very important to get your blood pressure under control. So for the exercises, some, are, some of the things, you might like dancing, anything which you like, the physical activity which you like, which will increase your heart rate is good. Some people will like gardening, walking, jogging, or some people, if they have arthritis, swimming is a bit best, good exercise. So the key is you, do not, you don't have to try doing like 40 minutes of exercise and like, you know, if you're not used to. So you can start at 15 to 20 minutes. Consistency is the key. Increase it every week or every other week and reach the goal. That is important than doing once in a while. So medications, these are the medications that your doctor is going to put to control your blood pressure. These are diuretics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, AC inhibitors, and some other medications. So we are done with the hypertension topic. The next topic is that high cholesterol, hypercholesterolemia. Cholesterol, what is cholesterol? It's a fatty substance that is in our body. So do we need it? We don't need it. Yes, we do. So every cell in our body, the cell membrane contains the cholesterol. Not only the just cell membrane, there are certain important hormones, sex hormones and uh, glucocorticoids, they require cholesterol to synthesize them. And vitamin D has cholesterol. And also some digestive enzymes have the cholesterol. So our body needs certain amount of cholesterol. So it's essential part of our body. So cholesterol, when it is in the body, it circulates in the form of lipoproteins. They are called low density lipoprotein cholesterol, very low density lipoprotein cholesterol and high density lipoprotein, lipoprotein cholesterol. So those are VLDL, <coughs> LDL and HDL. And these are triglycerides, all these are the fats in the body. So along with this lipoprotein cholesterol, triglycerides, I'm going to talk about all these things now. So what is VLDL cholesterol? When the, the, it starts in the liver. Liver synthesizes, like you know, it starts packaging the cholesterol with some protein so that it can circulate through the blood. So liver synthesizes the VLDL cholesterol. So it releases into the blood. So when the VLDL cholesterol comes into the blood, it gives off the triglycerides. Triglycerides are the fatty stores of the body. So once it releases the triglycerides, it becomes the LDL cholesterol. So this is the LDL cholesterol is the bad cholesterol that we'll be talking about and we have to intervene to control the amount of the LDL cholesterol so that we won't be at risk for the heart disease. So why is it a bad cholesterol? LDL cholesterol is called bad cholesterol. Why is it bad? So why? Because it causes a plaque formation in the blood vessels. The yellow substance is the bad cholesterol deposited underneath the membrane of the blood vessel. So as it deposits more and more, the blood vessel narrows. And when the blood vessel gets narrow and narrow, the blood circulation compromises to the vital organs. That is the main problem. Mainly before you go on to medications, you have to understand what are the risk factors, how you can help yourself to control the risk factors. Like hypertension, this is also similar. Doing some lifestyle changes will reduce your risk of having high cholesterol and hypertension both. So that's why I chose these two topics together because both of them needs the patient's participation and uh, motivation and uh, being proactive helps them more than the doctor putting them on the medications. Again, lifestyle modification. I, the, it is pretty much the same about the diet except for the sodium. Sodium is uh, for the hypertension. For the high cholesterol, you have to eat more of beans, legumes, seeds, and nuts. Nuts will have the fats, but you know they are the good fats that you have. And you have to eat more of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, Soluble fiber found in foods will help to reduce your cholesterol. If you are eating the soluble fiber, like you know, when you eat oatmeal, that bran, that helps, it's a soluble fiber that prevents the absorption of the cholesterol from the gut into your blood. So it reduces the absorption. Even if you eat, it goes away. It won't get absorbed into the blood. 
and sometimes you may want to eat small portions and more often than eating like you know starving for a few hours and going and eating when you are very hungry you tend to eat without looking at the labels or what is there whatever is available you tend to eat that than choosing wisely so there are some substances uh, called stanols and sterols in the food that helps to lower your cholesterol lately there is uh, there are studies going on to add that to your food will help to reduce your cholesterol so this it is naturally found in certain fruits vegetables lentils and nuts when you eat that that stanols and sterols prevents the cholesterol to get into the blood that's how it works when you are eating vegetables and fruits they have fibers the fibers there are two types of fibers that are going to help you one is soluble fiber the other one is insoluble fiber soluble fiber will prevent cholesterol absorption and reduces the glu glucose uh, absorption into the blood it reduces the glucose ab absorption into the blood it slows down basically cholesterol it prevents the absorption into the blood and because it slows down the gastric motility you feel full for the most of the time and insoluble fibers they are not going to be digested they add the bulk to the stools so it prevents the constipation and it prevents hemorrhoid formation so cholesterol and nuts nuts will contain lot of fats along with the fa fats they do have a protein fiber and mono the fats that they contain are the mono unsaturated fats these are the fats the, those are essential for our body function so they also contains vitamins nutrients antioxidants so when there are nuts the fda had let the people promote their foods when they have nuts to say that eating a diet that contains 1 ounce of nuts daily reduces your risk of heart disease so when there are nuts in their food products they can label their food as heart healthy so omega 3 fatty acids it helps to reduce your triglycerides so some of the foods will have this omega 3 fatty acids the plant source there is another slide which has whole list of the foods that have this omega 3 fatty acids walnuts flax seed flax seed oil canola soybean fish sources are salmon tuna mackerel krill and sardines these will contain the omega 3 fatty acids that helps to reduce your triglycerides first you have to exercise eat healthy and try to check your uh, cholesterol levels in few months and if your cholesterol is still high you have high risk uh, other risk factors that we mentioned earlier then your doctor will decide on putting you on some medication main medications that they might be putting you on are the statins these are all the other groups of medications fibrates niacin cholesterol absorption inhibitors bile acid sequestrants omega 3 fatty acids this is there in some foods that we talked about you may help yourself by taking more of omega 3 fatty acid containing foods that helps to reduce your triglycerides and these are the new group of medications pcsk9 inhibitors so let's see how this is the medication that i'm going to talk how it helps you so when you take that medication it reduces the synthesis of cholesterol when the cholesterol is being formed in your liver it prevents the synthesis of the <coughs> packaging of the cholesterol so when there is cholesterol low cholesterol in the liver the cholesterol whichever is circulating will come into the liver it increases the absorption of cholesterol by your liver when it comes into the liver it gets disintegrated so and also reduces the plaque formation it reduces the cholesterol synthesis so there will be less cholesterol to circulate to come into the plaque and also it helps in the blood vessel it alters the smooth muscle cells it changes and also it stabilizes the cell wall here and it reduces the inflammatory cells in the plaque that when the cholesterol comes in the cells were taking it up and forming the bigger macrophages taking up and forming the foam cells that reduces and also it helps reduces the friction in the blood flow reduces protein associated with inflammation so because there is less inflammation so when you have the heart disease when you take this statin medication that helps to reduce your cholesterol and also to reduce the plaque formation and stabilizes the plaque so they have some certain side effects when you take these medications they have some side effects that you should know so when you are on these medications and you have some muscle aches and pains you should let your doctor know it causes inflammation in the muscles and degradation of the muscles so inflammation of the muscles when you have the muscle aches the doctor will check your cpk to see how it is and if the muscle inflammation increases that that may lead to the kidney problem
kidney failure that the muscle products go and get uh, excreted when it is trying to be excreted through the kidneys the kidneys will be affected so the, it is very important for you if you have any muscle aches and pains when you are started on this statin medication for your cholesterol you should let your doctor know and also it might affect your liver the doctor will check the liver enzymes to see whether it's uh, being affected after once he starts the medication after a certain amount of time they can check the liver enzymes also so the important uh, side effect is the myositis the muscle muscle aches and pains and muscle inflammation that you should be aware of and let your doctor know about it so i just wanted to mention couple of things cholesterol and hypertension cholesterol and diabetes when you have diabetes your risk of hypercholesterolemia increases so the sugar gets attached to the ldl particles and it keeps in the blood for longer time so when the bad cholesterol is in the blood there is the chance that that gets go goes and gets deposited in the blood vessel so when you have diabetes and uh, high cholesterol you are at very high risk of getting the heart disease so when you have diabetes you have to control your cholesterol either by li lifestyle modification and if it is not sufficient you have to be on the medications to get it under control so that you won't have any heart problems or strokes again hypertension and cholesterol when you have cholesterol when there is a plaque formation the blood vessel gets narrowed when the blood gets narrowed blood vessel the blood has to flow through the narrow blood vessel so there is an increased burden on the heart and the blood pressure increases and when the blood pressure is increased it is also high risk for heart attack so hypertension and cholesterol two together are causing more problems for the heart increasing your heart attack risk so again as i mentioned earlier these are the foods that has omega 3 fatty acids the main important thing is you have to be proactive control the risk factors which you can control to help yourself to control your cholesterol and hypertension if it is still high your doctor will help you by putting you on the medications and we like to, to the program thank you okay